I'm Dave Bryant, and I'm here today with my man Greg Bendian, with whom I uh, recorded uh, Night Visitors CD in April of 2018, and it was finally released at uh, the height of quarantine season. Uh, and unfortunately, we have lost in the meantime our comrade Charnet Moffat, great virtuoso, uh, love we got to work with. And uh, tonight we're going to do, I guess, what is going to be the closest we'll ever get to do to a CD release concert. And uh, we've got uh, Hill Green, who is another magnificent bassist, joining us tonight. But this will be uh, Greg and my first chance to revisit this material since uh, 2018. So very much looking forward to that. And Greg, always a pleasure to chat. And now we're doing it in public. So that's We are. Yeah. Greg is also the uh, host of the Prague cast, where he uh, speaks to musicians on the subject uh, that's dear to my heart of uh, progressive rock and fusion and uh, lots of other work in that vein. So I'm a big fan, so be sure and check out his channel on that. And uh, so Greg, lovely to see you. Thanks, Dave. So let's talk about the, the Ornette thing. So um, how did you first become aware of Ornette's music? when you were growing up? Uh, as a teenager, making the transition uh, from prog rock to avant-garde jazz, it was a big thing for me to find the most challenging, most progressive music. And somehow in my teenage mind, I knew I didn't want to be just a rock musician. Um, and I was very interested in classical and contemporary classical and chamber music, and also interested in the, whatever was the cutting edge version of progressive rock in jazz. Uh -huh. So that would mean that with electric instruments, electronics, it would mean uh, a kind of atonal writing, it would mean a new approach to, to melody, whatever I could find in the new jazz. So the first stuff, that we got into was largely coming from where I grew up in Teaneck at the library. We had a great record collection at the library. So they had the Cecil Taylor New World album with the green cover, and they had Three Faces. They had um, Ornette album with LaFaro, Ornette, which was big for me, particularly because Ed Blackwell was one of my gods, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, as we did with, with all the rock shows, we went to all the jazz shows. And so I grew up in high school going to Soundscape for concerts on 52nd Street. Uh, Verna Gillis had everybody in there from Sun Ra to Jimmy Lyons groups and with Karen Borka and Blackwell with Dewey Redman and all sorts of different groups, as well as the public theater where I first saw primetime. So the public theater, that would have been around 79, 80. A uh, lot of concerts there. I saw um, Globe Unity, their orchestra. I saw uh, Carla and Charlie's protest music. What was that called? Liberation, Liberation music. Liberation yeah. music. Um, with Don Cherry on trumpet. So all of those guys were around and playing in different groups. You know, I saw Dewey with Fred Hopkins on bass and, and Blackwell trio. I, I saw Ornette with the quartet with Blackwell. I saw Old and New Dreams without Ornette, everybody else. And, um, and that really launched me into full-fledged avant-garde jazz, cutting edge, free improvisation and since I also had an interest in chamber music and, and classical, it really caught my attention that Ornette had an orchestral piece, Skies of America, and spent a lot of time listening to that. Also, uh, Sounds and Forms yeah. for Wind Quintet, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, remember that? Um, and really, the way I did with Cecil's music, just tried to get everything. So uh, all the Charlie Duo stuff, Soap Suds, Soap Suds. Yeah. Um, what, what, no, Soap Suds, what was it called? Yeah, yeah. 
Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman's the first tune on right, that. Right, right, right. Okay, Soap Says, Soap Says, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. Um, and so, yeah, those were like models for me. Um, in fact, my audition tapes uh, that I sent out to try to get to like into Tufts and, and uh, BU and different schools up here actually, uh, I would play along to the Charlie duo records. Oh, yeah. Because they're music minus drums. So the Charlie and Ornette duets and, and anything that I could play along to, including like Indent or the Cecil Solo records, that's how I learned how to play that kind of free jazz. Our I late friend those. Bob Galati, drummer, used to tell me that he had practiced with Skies of America. Sure. Yeah. 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 And, you know, we didn't have the internet, so we just got everything we could get. I should also mention that I grew up within earshot of Columbia University WKCR radio, and all of that music was covered on the radio, including with interviews. So I could actually hear the guys. They'd stop by the studio and talk about what they were doing and talk about the concepts. And Ornette was on there, and different guys were on there. Cecil, Max was on there. And uh, so what age yeah. are you at this point? 16, 17. Yeah. And, you know, we took the bus into the city all the time because like right. seven miles from my house was the George Washington Bridge. And, and yeah, and then we'd see the guys on the street and I could feel comfortable enough to go up to Ed Blackwell and say, excuse me, Mr. Blackwell, I'm Lonely Woman. What are you thinking? Are you just thinking pulse? Are you thinking odd meters? And he, he was very friendly and he said, no, it's, it's just open pulse. Hmm. And that meant a lot to me at 17, because I, I've had a, from the, the word from the guy, yeah. this is what we're doing conceptually. You know, I was always very curious. What are they thinking? What are they doing? And I would get yelled at. Actually, Don Moyer yelled at me once. He said, go, just go sit down and listen. <laughs> <laughs> and I like that too. You know, like the guys, they were, um, they were engaging with us. And that felt really good. You know, Shannon Jackson was very uh, helpful and very open too. So I followed him around for a while. And as a result, you know, got into the, all the decoding society stuff. And for me, it was, it was really clear that guys like Ornette, they're gonna do whatever they wanted to do. And that was very liberating for me because Absolutely. then I realized, oh, I can play jazz, I can play rock, I can write chamber music and nobody will arrest me, you know what I mean? Uh, so yeah, that, that was an important part of my coming into the new jazz stuff was hearing Ornette where there was usually time, there was usually swing, there was usually groove, there was, you know, whereas with Cecil, the only time that occurred was when Shannon would start playing a right. shuffle in the middle of the maelstrom, right, right. you know. It'd just be a juxtaposition. <laughs> like that, yeah. Yes. But with Ornette, it was like Charlie and Blackwell were locked in. And then, you know, you got the concept of a foundation with stuff floating on top. Um, so I think that, you know, I had a real understanding of Ornette's music by the time I started doing my own music around 20 playing with John Zorn and Derek Bailey and, and Mark Dresser and guys like that, um, who were also all huge Ornette guys. I mean, at the end of the day, you don't you know, pass go without stopping at like guys like Zappa, Ornette, Cecil, you know, the, the big forces in the music. Um, but this was for you, this is at the same time that you're checking out the different rock groups and different kinds of it things. It is. Like that. I mean, yeah. I had I had really shifted though. Right. Like I I was anti rock a little bit at that point oh. because I'm like, well, if we're really going to move forward, we have to move away from prog rock and move into what I ended up calling chamber jazz. Mm. That's kind of for me that's what we're doing. Uh -huh. You know, um it's, it's a chamber group. We listen, we are dynamic like a chamber group, but it's also jazz. And I, a lot of that stuff I got from hearing Ornette with Eisenzim, hearing Ornette with Scott LaFaro, and hearing all the different approaches that Ornette did to trio, not just the quartet, yeah. but again, the, the pianolists 
or with the music without the harmonic underpinning of a keyboard was very important. So a lot of my groups then didn't have, right. you know, keyboard or didn't have guitar, you know, it was just horns. First Greg Bendian project is just Smoker, Golia, Dresser and me. And it's very much modeled after the classic Hornet Quartet. A good band. <laughs> it's a pretty good band, yeah. Counterparts. And um, so do you want me to talk about the, how I ended up working with Hornet? Absolutely. But before you do, the hmm. reason I brought up that about you were listening to other music at the same time and at that age, at that age, right through my high school years and then transitioning to college, uh, I very much was into that kind of thing of, I was into one thing and then I shifted and I was into something else. And then I shifted to another thing and I had that feeling as though I had to put aside what I had just been listening to for the previous two years and thoroughly immerse myself into whatever that new thing was. And it wasn't until a few years later that I actually got back into the well, they are reintegrating everything yeah. and having everything talk to each other. And it was very much the light bulb went off and I realized I could do it because what you run into is people who are only into one thing ever. And so that's who your role model is at the time, or that was the case for me. And then I had to be the one finally to say, no, I, I can be into everything. And more than that, I, I kind of have to be into everything. So, but you were, at the time though, at 16, you were like, obviously I'm just growing from all this at the same time and it's talking to each other internally. Right? It was, um, plus we didn't have snobbery yet. You know, it was like, oh, that's cool. Ornette's on Island Records, you know, like Blood's on Columbia. It was like normal, yeah. so we, we didn't think that was really any different from, I don't know, whatever the latest King Crimson effort was, you know, mm -hmm. like around the same time, Discipline, 82, all the other, uh, prime time is popping at that moment. And we didn't really think there was much of a difference between those kinds of counterpoint. Right, well, if you <laughs> were reading Downbeat then, like in the- I'm reading Downbeat. And like in the late 70s, and for me coming, it was sort of like, it's this secret society that you're trying to pledge, you know, as an initiate. And you think, all right, well, what is it I don't, I, there's some things I'm familiar with, other things I need to learn. And in one issue, it'd be a review of the new Braxton album. Oh yeah. It'd be something about a review of a gig that, some trad gig that Bob Wilbur did or something like that. Mm -hmm. And there'd be some mainstream Oscar Peterson or something like that. And it would be like, I have to learn about all of this. I have to know about it. I have to know who the people are. I have to have heard it. I have to yeah. own the records and I have to be able to play it. And it was like, it wasn't a question of which side am I on? It nope. was like, if I don't know at all, I'm going to be left out. I didn't really come to know that there were sides until I saw a double bill of Cecil Taylor and Oscar Peterson at the uh, Carnegie Hall mm -hmm. for some festival and people walked out on Cecil. And I started to see that, oh, you know, Cecil's kind of extreme, I guess, compared to Oscar Peterson, but I knew that Cecil claimed Oscar Peterson and Tatum and these guys as being his forebear, you know, his, his, his ancestors. So I always loved the idea of tradition. Like, where did it come from? Where does it go? Um, and I always loved Ornette as a post-Charlie Parker guy and, you know, as a jazz alto saxophonist as much as I loved his tunes, as much as I loved his, his writing, as much as I loved his bands. Um, and so, you know, I always knew Ornette and Jimmy Lyons for that matter, were really coming out of the tradition of bebop uh -huh. in some way or another. And they had their own version of it. And again, that was very instructive because then you have to come up with your own version of it, yeah. right? Yeah. So, if, you know, when I write bebop kind of lines, they're, they're much more angular and atonal, but certainly Ornette and, and um, even Braxton to a certain extent kind of took you into this other compartment where pitch could be more varied and dissonance was included, right. density was included. It wasn't so much about 
um, clean and, and, uh, and mm -hmm. careful. I like that. Um, I liked how Don Cherry turned mistakes into motifs. <laughs> you know, I caught on to that idea. Um, and yeah, I just went to everything Ornette did, every possible thing. I saw the quartet open for prime time, you know. Uh, that was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, be immersed like that. I remember that was Town Hall, I think. I saw a song X, yeah. you know. Um, and then I ended up working with Matheny, and he told me all about how they, they worked out that material and, and the process of, um, I don't know if, if, uh, if you've ever heard them talk about this, but literally uh, a tune like Trigonometry. I said, how did, you, how did you write that, Pat? He said, literally, I played a phrase, and then Ornette answered me. Then Pat went, not surprising. And then Ornette says, then Pat went, but dun 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 and then Ornette, dun 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 dun. That's you know. So uh -huh. this idea of um, Ornette was like he's collaborating with Pat Metheny now, you know. So he's he's unbound, and that was very inspiring to me. Uh -huh. Plus seeing him with Jack and how important Jack was to all of us, not just as drummers but as you know band leaders. Absolutely, you know. And, and, and hearing him with Charlie, too, at the time. Hearing him with very Charlie. Very unusual. Yes. They didn't do that much. Well, they said. Well, 80, 81. Yeah. And then that, uh, that uh, Lovano uh, album, they did something together, and Gonzalo Rubalcaba. Yes. Remember? Yeah. And, um, but, yeah, at the time, I remember thinking, back in the 70s, I remember there was an article, an uh, interview on Keith Jarrett that Conrad Silvert did. Mm -hmm. right? when uh, the Sun Bear Concerts oh, album yeah. came up. And he was saying, talking about things that Keith would be doing in the future, and he said one thing that was on the drawing board was a trio album with uh, Charlie and Jack. And I remember thinking, that would be the ultimate. Because, you know, you want to hear the, the, the Keith with Jack thing <laughs> and the Keith with Charlie thing, <laughs> which at the time were, you know, never the twain shall meet, and they never did, you know. Yeah. But at the time, that was like... Uh, what that what would that even sound like? Because you know the Keith of the with the Jack thing, Miles with the Kenny Wheeler, that great album, Charles Lloyd, so forth. But then the Charlie thing was a whole nother deal, and you think, put them together, what would that be like? What would Keith play like? And so I kept waiting for that. And of course, with Song X, that was with the, the uh, ECM engineer, even you know, and it's like wow. And you think, well. well Keith ever do anything with Ornette because you know he wrote that song for OC. Of course. On the, and you think, oh, that's a, that, they got to hook up. That's right around yeah. the corner, you know. And so it was like, when Song X happened, it was like, that was kind of the record I'd put together in my head for Keith, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, uh, that was amazing. Just, just the, the idea of hearing uh, Jack and Charlie together. That was. That was day and night, the, the, the marriage of the sun and moon, you know. And I mentioned the, uh, the Carla Blay ensemble thing with Charlie. That was Charlie and Paul Motion. Mm. And at one point, it was Charlie, Paul, and Don Cherry trio. Mm. And I will never forget that moment. I bet. Because all of a sudden, it just like, it got crazy. And it was just three guys. So it broke down from a 12-piece band down to these two, you know, three guys. And... It was very clear to me at that moment. Um, see, because hearing guys outside of their normal context mm -hmm. always taught me a lot. So I never saw uh, Charlie and Paul together. But when I did, I saw them with Don Cherry. And I never heard Don Cherry with Paul Motion before. So it was another way of hearing oh, you can play slower. Like, that was the other thing. Paul, you know, Paul kind of looked at it, as you know, like these wide swaths of color, these wide swaths of rhythm. And Charlie also was kind of a wide, mm -hmm. you know, open kind of player. And hearing Don Cherry in, in that situation, not with Ornette, I got to see him as much as I could too, you know, sitting in whatever, where he would show up with his horn and just play. Um, that that group of guys was really huge for me. Right. And uh, I should say before we get off Song X too, 
as uh, as we both know now from from being uh, band leaders to a certain extent, I guess I don't know what you'd call it, social chops that Pat had to have to put that together and pull it off. He has social chops, yes. Because not anybody could do that. You can't just be a good player and have your agent call those guys up and put it together and, you know, I mean, you've got to be able to deal with them all as people and have that work out that way. So yeah. props to you, Pat, if you're watching. Um, but so like what year now would it have been that, uh, that you hooked up to, to play on this uh, uh, Nornet's Chamber piece? Um, the beginning or uh, first part of 2000, Tom Chu, the violinist from... The Flux Quartet, interesting mm -hmm. quartet that had have done a bunch of stuff in, interfacing classical with jazz, like uh, Oliver Lake has done a bunch of stuff with them. And Tom was working with Ornette, I guess, on putting together the statue, which my understanding was had been played before. It was dedicated to the Statue of Liberty. Right. So the full title, right, was uh, the country who gave the freedom symbol to America? Was that what Is it? Was? That's what I had. My score had says La Statue. Oh, okay. Because the, I had seen it referred to with that That's longer, cool. longer title, because uh, that was commissioned by the French government, right? I guess so, yeah. Yeah, that was my understanding. So, And I hadn't heard it. I don't know if it had been, if it had been played. I hadn't heard the recording. But of course, you know, Tom Chu had played some of my music with the Flux Quartet. And he said, you know, we're putting together this chamber group for Ornette's piece to play at the festival. And um, would you be interested in playing timpani? Because he knew I was a tuned percussionist as well. I said, of course, that would be great, you know. Um, and especially also um, because I had, I had hung out with and played with Donardo. So I was very comfortable being around those guys. Ornette was always with Donardo. You mm -hmm. might just talk to Donardo and Ornette would, mm -hmm. would just sort of be not in, in interacting with you, but... Sure. How did you, you meet Donardo then? I would just see him, I mean, after you, you see these shows, you know, if you right. see somebody on the street, I mean, I ran into those guys on 7th Avenue South. I'd see Donardo at somebody else's show, you okay. know? So, Donardo was at shows, all these guys, were, like I say, they were available, they were around, yeah. they were reachable. Um, and then Donardo and I had recorded some drum duets at my uh, request, because I was recording duets with different people, Paul Wertico and different drummers. Um, and Donardo and I recorded at Harmelotic in Harlem. So I guess I was kind of in their field of vision. And um, so I, I got the call, I said, you know, I'll do, I'd be happy to do it. I got there and it was the only people who were non-jazz, non-classical, sorry, were me and Lou Soloff. Yeah, or not Every, love Lou. Yeah, and Lou yeah. Soloff was great. And everybody else was Juilliard um, string players, I think. There might have been a couple of horn players. I can't really remember the full instrumentation. Um, so the first day of rehearsal, we, you know, we're all there. Music's on the stand, go over, got the timpani that I requested. And one of my favorite Ornette moments of all time occurred, which was he was in the room and I'm sort of waiting to see, you know, what he's going to say, what he's going to initiate, what he's going to do. And he walks over to me, stands next to the timpani, points to the timpani part. And he says, I don't want you to play any of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a load off of your mind, right? <laughs> well, only another one reason was it was because it was just dun dun da dun 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 da dun 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 dun. Yeah. He clearly had not put a lot of effort into the timpani part. It was almost like it was a placeholder. Right. And then right. he came to me, and it was me and the bass, this bass player, and because I was playing timpani, and the bass player was a classical guy, I thought. Well, I got four strings here, you know, maybe I can do chords and maybe I can pick up some of what Charlie had brought to the music in this piece. So I played very um, dyadically and triadically on the timpani, play, you know, with my hands and with different kinds of mallets because Ornette had given me a free pass. Yeah. He wanted me, uh, either he knew 
that I could do something right. or, but I had already worked with Cecil. So the idea of do your own thing was very common. Yeah. Like I noticed guys like Ornette and Cecil, they don't over explain if they don't feel they have to. Mm -hmm. If they feel they're getting what they want, they're like, cool, you got it. And that's very liberating, but it's, it also gives you a lot of confidence that, oh, he wants my input. But you're right. And I, since I'm that kind of composer, or I want the side man's input, I, I thought, he's got it, he's right. Uh -huh. You know, this is true, this is what you want. It's democratic, it's, you want to people to contribute. Was there anything in the written score that led you to think it should be incorporated in any way? Or was it just that it just seemed so so rote that you just say, well, this is obviously not. I mean, I'll be happy to, to show it to you at some point, uh -huh. but it wasn't to me like a serious timpani part. Yeah. And I had played Beethoven seventh and a lot of really heavy timpani parts. But I knew he wanted low end. I mean, he, he you know right. he had a bass player that was playing with a bow, and he had a timpani player. So what was that going to be like? So they, the ensemble was pretty uncomfortable. Um, it was hard to get them to loosen up. Yeah. They really were classical players, right. and twenty something years ago, less common for classical players to be f happy to improvise. Yeah. So was he asking similar things of them? He, you know, uh, if you've ever been uh, on stage for one of the uh, Ornette strategies of everybody's going to solo mm. back to back. Yeah, yeah. There was that in there. Yeah. Um, and it took a long time to get to everybody. And I remember the audience being really impatient with it. It was the festival audience. It was... First, it was Ornette and Donardo with Badal and uh, Sultan Khan, who, who was the Indian musician they worked with at that time, besides Badal. Yeah, I'm not sure who was on Vina player? Yeah. Okay, so that was opening, then it was the statue. And that would have been musicians that, that Badal brought in. But no, it was like a known right, cat right, from right. Indian music. And then it was the trio with... Uh, Charlie and um, Billy Higgins. Right, right. Because Cherry had passed by that time, so that yeah. was one of the first by things they did after that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it was in Battery Park. It was in Battery so Park. So you could see the statue off to the side. Yeah, yeah it was cool. Yeah. Um, another cool thing that happened uh, on that experience was my parents came to the concert, and another favorite Ornette moment was I see my parents coming and my dad comes over and he's a big jazz fan. So I'm talking to my dad in the middle of Battery Park and I see Ornette coming out of catering, which is like 75 yards that way. <laughs> he sees me talking to my dad and he completely changes direction and he's walking directly at us. And I'm thinking, whoa, Ornette's coming over now. And he just comes right over and he goes up to my dad and he shakes my dad's hand and he says, I really enjoy working with your son. He's very talented. And we were both blown away, my dad and I. <laughs> Isn't that I, wonderful? You know, yeah. It was so cool. Yeah. One of my you know, all-time great, all great memories. I remember when I introduced uh, my father to Ornette and he said, it's a pleasure to meet David's other father. <laughs> and, and Ornette looked absolutely horrified. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was like, like the eyes bugged out of his head and my father said i said it's a pleasure to meet you. and he was like no, I, I heard you the first time <laughs> yeah but it was so a, that was a wonderful moment you had it was there. a generous yeah. moment you know uh he didn't have to do that but he went out of his way to do it i mean literally um so i you know i had great affection for him in terms of you know, when the older guys accept you, it's huge. Yeah. You know, because now you say, oh, what I'm doing is valid. I can go do my thing. And, you know, 23 years ago, sure, that was a big moment. Um, but I, I did feel like that it wasn't what I really wanted to bring to his music. Now, I like 
that the distinction of being Ornette's timpanist <laughs> would be one of my credits, but I really wanted to play drum set with him, you know, and I didn't get the opportunity to do that. So I kind of brought some of my rhythmic things and, and textural ideas to the timpani parts and had to be satisfied with that. All, after the gig, uh, we were asked to come record the piece. So we went up to Harmelodic Studios, I think a couple of days, same people, but Gary Giddens was there, and I don't know if he was there as a producer or if he was there just to cover hmm. what was going on. And so I spoke to Gary because he, he had been very supportive of my work with Cecil when very few critics had at that time. You know, what's this, what's this white drummer playing with Cecil Taylor? And I, at the time, I was blown away because I wasn't the first one. I followed Tony Oxley in the band. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, oh, you have a problem with Tony Oxley or you have a problem with me or what is, you know. But you always knew with guys like Cecil and Ornette, they didn't see color. They just heard you. And if you were doing something creative, 100% there, you know. And that was another great lesson too. I never got the feeling if there was a problem with what I was playing, it was because I was white. It was because yeah, exactly. I played the wrong thing. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also the fact that, you know, don't, let's not, uh, let's put a, a, a bit of a, a pin on that, that idea too, that both Cecil and Ornette liked classically trained guys. There was value in what he would try to get out of those guys musically in both cases. Mm. You know, I was around when Cecil was commissioned by the Kronos Quartet. And I was working with Cecil and he wrote a piece for the Kronos Quartet. So you see what I mean? It's just like nobody thought there was a barrier in terms of culture. Nobody thought there was a barrier in terms of genre. Nobody thought there was any barrier. Well, a great follow-up question has presented itself, of course, which is how would you compare the relationship each of them had in turn with classical tradition? Oh. Well, I know more about Cecil's connection to it than Ornette's, admittedly. Um, Cecil, I knew all of his classical shit. I knew he was into Bartok. I knew he was into Scriabin. I knew he was into Stravinsky, particularly Agon. Um, I knew he was, you know, I had the experience of, um, I was playing trio with Bratzman and, and William Parker, and uh, Shannon Jackson and Cecil both showed up backstage but it was a chaos backstage and Cecil comes in the room and the first thing he says to me is Bendian have you heard the new Elliot Carter piano concerto and everybody kind of looks like what is what is he talking about you know but I love that about like Ornette Cecil even Blood who I mentioned to you the other day came to hear when I curated the classical series at the Knitting Factory and I programmed the bar talk string quartets and blood was in the audience listening and loving the, the bar talk and that was again reinforcing this whole idea of well, everybody's listening to everything and also classical music cutting edge classical music is as interesting as cutting edge jazz both sides yeah. right and um i had difficulty with ornette's classical connections because I didn't really know who he was. I couldn't tell who he was into. Um, I liked Skies of America a lot because the, the parallel stuff that was going on in terms of the harmony, moving things around, parallelism, had a real vibe to it. I liked that. Um, and then uh, Songs and Forms, I remember just having a lot more trouble with that. It seemed much more abstract in a way, and I don't know yeah. how Skies of America isn't abstract, but there's something about Skies of America where, well, for instance, one of my favorite Ornette pieces of all time is Sunday in America, which I think is the last part of Skies. And I thought, oh, this guy listened to Charles Ives, at mm -hmm. the very least, I hope, you know, and I never got to ask him, maybe right. you'd know better than me. I, you know, I later found out Alan Holzer was into Charles Ives, and that makes sense. So. I don't know, but 
Charles Eyes would be a great model for, for guys like Cecil and Ornette because he did whatever the hell he wanted and nobody told him he couldn't. You know, the only classical composer that I remember him maybe mentioning even that we talked about, and I think it may have been because he had the, the classical radio station on one day and we were talking about it, was Mozart. Hmm. And I think he had an affinity for that kind of uh, linear melodic writing. Sure. You know? And you think about some of his even like dancing in your head, one of those kind of themes. Very kind of Mozartian in a way, you know? And that sense of proportion uh, in his line and uh, uh, intervallic balance, you know? Uh, something very as freewheeling as Ornette could be. It was also something very um, organized about his, his treatment and, and uh, the way he would construct a line. And I remember telling him once, I said, you know, it's a funny thing. I said, people always talk about harmony like, um, like they're working out some sort of mathematical problem or something like that. And, and uh, they think uh, melody is a gift from the muse somehow, and they just want to take dictation and write it down as it comes and not alter it all. And I said, you know, I'm the exact opposite. I said, I tend to like struggle over a line and adjust every little interval and then just splash in harmony like color. And he says, oh, I'm the same way. And I was like, sometimes, every once in a while, he would say something like that in conversation. I would think he was just being a, a pleasant conversationalist. Oh, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, oh, I'm the same way, you know, just to give you like a pat on but the back. But don't you think? But I think in that case, yeah, that he, I think he, it really was the way he thought. But I think that those guys were, by the very um, nature of improvisation of multiple people, involved with counterpoint so Absolutely. i would i could see how bach or or uh mozart or, or any of the heaviest classical guys could could teach them and us multiple lines and how they move against each other now, i might want to draw a slight distinction between counterpoint per se and general polyphony you know what i mean so there's this well sort that's of, the yeah. resultant yeah but you know what i mean so it's sort of like it doesn't there, there was not necessarily a, that kind of a precision in the way it lined up vertically. Uh, With Ornette. Yeah, no, it's not precise a lineup, yeah. but it's happening. It's line against it, line. It's doing what it's doing. It's line against line. I mean, it's voice yeah. against voice, yeah. and that's that was also became very transparent to me with the absence of guitar or keyboard. Right. Now he would say to us though, here's this line, here's that line, yeah. and you play this, you play that, make it work. Yep. Put it together. So it would be wouldn't necessarily be the same number of bars, but you'd know to contract or to spread it out mm -hmm. so it worked together. But anyway, go ahead. So it was that kind of sensibility to me instead of this note against that note. It was more like uh, there was a balance in the voice itself as defined by the... the I line. agree. I think it's voice against voice. I mean, that's what we were taught anyway, yeah, right? It's, yeah. it's line against line, but they're voices that are moving. Um, so when I was studying counterpoint in college or um, orchestration, anything like that, I was always trying to apply it to what I had already heard, uh -huh. you know? So... I would analyze Skies of America, or I would analyze uh, any of Ornette's group pieces, and like, what are people doing? You know, what are they trying? What are they trying to go for? What are they not doing? Which is another big thing for me. You know, what? It, you know, it never went out of time. You know, so that's clearly delineated in Ornette's music. So I like that. Th there's freedom. But there's also like a kind of form and a format and a platform for a defined platform for these guys. Uh -huh. um, and I don't know to what degree that comes from classical, to what degree it comes from Dixieland, because there's, of course, polyphony and, and multiple lines moving in, in Dixieland. But I know that it was like to me at that time, both jazz and classical. Uh -huh. There was something about it that right. spoke to me as, well, like Milton Babbitt has this piece all set for jazz ensemble. And that's his attempt at sort of 
creating free jazz, you know, in a way. Everybody's independent. The drum set part is linear. And he had some some actual background in jazz, right? And he was a uh, Charlie yeah. Parker aficionado. Yeah. So yes, he knew jazz. He wrote show tunes. He wrote jingles. I mean, Babbitt, you know, big, big musical output. Um, you know, my na naivete, I thought the classical guys, if they accepted Bird, they accepted Ornette. If they accepted Bird, they accepted Jimmy Lyons. I, I didn't know that oh, that stuff's too weird or it's formless. And, and I always disagreed. I got into an argument with P Pierre Boulez about it in particular because he's like, oh, improvisation, we dealt with that in the 60s, you know. Mm -hmm. So I saw the prejudice. I saw people who didn't have the prejudice. And I thought, I'm gonna, I like those guys that are into everything. And Ornette was always one of those guys. So, you know, you know something I was thinking about the other day, as I found online uh, a couple of interviews that somebody had posted uh, with Keith Jarrett from maybe 20 years ago. And he was very much talking about his background and his music with this, I guess that's because the path his career had taken at that point in this sort of there was this dichotomy between classical and jazz and yeah. the background and the mindset and so forth but I was thinking how soon they forget because back at the time in the 60s late 60s early 70s one of the biggest things about Keith was how he incorporated elements from rock music mm -hmm. and from folk music mm -hmm. in particular and I'm thinking with uh, with Ornette as well because with Charlie Hayden and, uh, and with Keith also uh, with Charlie, you know, covering tunes by Joni Mitchell, Bob Dylan and so yeah. forth, that kind of triadic harmony that actually both of them shared, Ornette and Keith. And Ornette with that um, uh, background that incorporated a, a, something from the, the country blues, oh, yeah. this very kind of rural kind of thing, which had in its way this something in common with uh, uh, this other strand of folk music coming in, this rural quality. and um, Which, of course, is a great gateway for Matheny into that yeah, music. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And um, so, uh, but then when we talk about classical tradition, which is being treated like it's the exact opposite, you think about how folk music influenced Bartok or other uh, classical composers like that. And I was thinking about in both cases, there is that the the dichotomy that cuts across jazz and classical is this balance and this uh, uh, somehow not uneasy alliance between the urban and the rural and the formal and the informal and the uh, the complex and the the simpler and the strength that's in the simpler. So yep. it's not just that one's uh, sophisticated and then the other one is. Uh, well, it's, it's yeah. two things that I, Cecil said that always blew my mind um, that I really feel he shared with Ornette, which was that uh, one note can be a beautiful thing to shape one note. And even thinking of as a percussionist, Cecil's playing a percussion instrument. Yeah, yeah. How are we shaping that one note? Yeah, I was going to say, you don't, you don't get enough piano players talking about that one note. No. Yeah, yeah. But you see, when Cecil did, it's like, oh, so if I do one note on the vibraphone or one note on the glockenspiel, what's the best note that I could do? You know, right, and right, so right. like like a singer who shapes every note, you have pianists like Cecil who would shape every note and Ornette, where you knew he would shape notes and would purposely tune notes a certain way. So that was also another folk thing, too, I felt was um, direct, simple right melody that you can sing that you right, could right. hum that you'll remember they do they both had that in common their ballads are both stunningly beautiful you know right. um so i think it's it's a very important point that on one level i felt like those guys thought this stuff was the heaviest thing heavier than classical music and at the same time thought of it as folk music yeah 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 you know what I mean? Exactly. It was because they would take on non-musical people. Remember that, right? Mm. They would take on folks to play the music and not necessarily like the virtuoso players. Right, right. Um, so there's that contrast where you have, I want the highest trained classical players. I want a guy who doesn't really know how to play his instrument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and that's e- intense. And, e- and even that thing of taking from both camps and putting them oh, together yeah. and just let's just see what happens. It's yeah. crazy, right? It's just so bonkers to do that. And yet, why were they so interested in it? That's interesting. And then there's the Miles technique of taking the accomplished musician and say, play like you don't play know like what you're you doing. Play like you don't know yeah. how to play, yeah. So I don't even know what, if I've ever come to a conclusion about that, but it is an interesting that they both were into that. And even, even Albert Eiler, I mean, if you look at what Sonny Murray is doing or what Gary Peacock is doing in that, um, you can't even really tell that they can play their instruments. I mean, if you're honest, you know, and you just say, but there's something very provocative about it. And there's something very otherworldly, honestly, about it. I always th- thought of Eiler as being kind of otherworldly. That stuff, would, that stuff scared me at times. <laughs> um, and I like that because I was into, I like being scared. I like, as you know, I like horror <laughs> movies and I like suspense and I like being uncomfortable uh, and then finding, you know, what's the energy, what's going on there. Um, yeah, and, and Ornette, I think by throwing in unpredictable stuff, it almost tied them into the, um, the chance operations stuff, the cage stuff, the, the, that even they had been, in a way, blown open wide by guys like Cage who said, you know, go, it can be, actually be no music. You know, you can have tons of sound or you can have zero sound. So in a way, I think that they were connected. I mean, plus, I know Cecil read like crazy. So he read all that stuff. He knew all the approaches. And that was also inspiring to see guys who read that much, guys that knew that much about other forms of art um, that that cared about color and texture and thought of music and in terms that weren't just musical. So when you talk about the folk element, well, you also talk, let's just talk about the individualist element where they're okay with failing, which is something Zawinul, I thought was very interesting. Zawinul said, you know, take out the stuff that's not happening, but there's gonna be some stuff that won't be happening because we're gonna go uncharted territory and try to make something happen. and then everybody has their own style of doing that and their own percentages of how much yeah. has worked out in advance, how much is spontaneous. Uh, but I did also connect, connect them to that classical tradition of indeterminacy because it is indeterminate. Yeah, yeah. You know, he doesn't know what you're going to do. Right, right, right. Yeah, right? I, never, I never quite got the cage thing of having to work that hard to make sure things didn't come out the way you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> that, but that, that it does happen. Came, but I was going to say it, that always came a little too easy for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Make it sound like you don't know what's going on. Yeah, no yeah, problem. No, that's not what I planned at all. <laughs> it, just like I planned it. Yeah. Well, this has been great. And Greg, again, being such an experienced interviewer with both the podcast and the Yale Oral History Project. So I hope you have had a chance today to be the interview subject you have always dreamed of getting. So. <laughs> yeah, I have. Thanks. To <laughs> so no, my awesome. pleasure. My pleasure. So to be continued. And uh, yeah, we'll have to do another one on uh, Prague and comic books one of these days. Yeah. Uh, David Lynch or something. Oh, yeah. So, yeah all right. <laughs> Anytime. Looking forward to playing tonight. Absolutely. It's been too long. Thanks very much.